Welcome back. We have a really fascinating article to dive into today on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and the natural sciences by Eugene Wigner. Um, I think that this is a very uh, well talked about piece of uh, literature at this point. I know I remember hearing about it a couple of times a uh, week, actually, when I was in grad school. Um, however, now I think that now that the time allows, I can actually dive into this piece and I'm really glad I did. Because there's a lot there to be said about this about this specific piece. And of course, uh, Wigner in his abstract here, or foreword, gives a nice quote of Bertrand Russell, which I'll let you read. Um, it is very nice to see that this comes together in a beautiful sense of poetry, which I definitely agree with, as a lot of mathematics is. But uh, without further ado, let's dive into the article. Um... He first opens up with, uh, Wigner opens up with this idea of, well, you know, math is weird because we see things like, um, pi being in things related to statistics, um, which, you know, generally doesn't happen, right? At least in the first thought of pi, which is the circumference and diameter ratio. Um, so it's not always apparent that math should be uniquely determined and used in science the way it is and the way it has been and it's you know nice to see that it can be but we have to do a little more digging as to why it actually is effective and he brings us to this uh you know nice quote in the page here which i think we need to hammer down and this is an actual bit of foresight and foreshadowing that wigner does being that how do we know that if we made a theory which focuses its attention on phenomena we dis disregard and disregard some of the phenomenon we that are now commanding our attention, that we cannot build another theory which has little in common with the present one, but which nevertheless explains just as many phenomena as the present theory? Which, again, makes a lot of sense when we're asking just a basic question. Do we just confine ourselves to the theories now because they are deemed right by our arbitrary definition of right and correct and that everything else that opposes that is wrong? Or can we build a complete theory off of what's wrong that will actually be a full theory that can combat what is what we now deem as right? So it's a mental tangle of for sure of what's going on. So to approach this problem, what he gives us is a paragraph here dictating how to uh, look at the uh, rest of the paper and what he does is split this up into two aspects the first is that mathematical concepts turn up in entirely unexpected connections just like pi does in statistics and that secondly we cannot know whether a theory formulated in terms of mathematical concepts is uniquely appropriate and again we'll see that in the later half of the paper only a couple pages on it actually compared to the other eight pages but that is the approach that we're going to have so let's dive into the heart of it here we see that in insofar as the first approach is concerned there is an enormous usefulness usefulness of mathematics and the natural sciences is something of borderline something bordering on the mysterious and that there is real no nat rational explanation for now, what we have to do in order to kind of convince ourselves of this uh, mystery and try to gain an insight to why it is so effective, we have to ask these questions of what is mathematics and what is physics. As you see, I'm trying to highlight things that are grouped together in the order that they will go in the paper. And so for the green highlights, we see that the uncanny usefulness of mathematics concept that rises or that raises the uh, question of the uniqueness of our physical theories, um, that to have a proper answer to this, you know, that would have to require elaborate experimental and theoretical work, which has not been undertaken to date. Now to date, meaning in 1960 when this was published. Um, and we have to just keep in mind that although it exists in mathematics, doesn't mean that you have the evidence for it in the physical world. All right, so moving on, what is mathematics? And he gives us a grand opening here, and to which he says, Mathematics is a science of skillful operations with concepts and rules invented just for this purpose. 
And what I interpret that as is math create math uh, creates for math's sake, right? So we just have these uh, ideas that we want to maneuver with and that we just build abstractions off of them. And we kind of, you know, push the boundaries with those abstractions. One of the things that comes to mind here is the Vera Strauss function, where we have a function that's continuous everywhere, but differentiable nowhere. So we really get to push the boundaries of what these definitions and concepts mean. And then, of course, we see that a couple good takeaway quotes here is that the, to further facilitate the level of abstraction in math is that the elementary mathematics that we saw growing up, it, particularly in geometry, were formulated by what we saw in the actual world. But this does not seem to hold true for the more advanced things that we now use because of this abstraction. And then he goes on to uh, do a little bit of work with stating the complex numbers algebras, linear operators, Borel sets. So those are the other abstractions that we use commonly now, but have no actual physical insight to the world, at least on first approach. And so back to the first point of what he's trying to do here in the paper is that the definition of these concepts with a realization that interesting and ingenious consideration could be applied to them is the first demonstration of the ingenious of the mathematician who defines them. So these mathematicians set themselves up for success in future, um, in a future sense because they allow for a level of abstraction in the theorems that they create or pivots, things of that nature. And from that, we get a great quote here about reasoning power, um, which is brought by Darwin's process of natural selection to the perfection that we see now in mathematics. Pretty cool little quote there from uh, Wigner to put in there. Mathematicians could formulate only a handful of interesting theorems without defining concepts, going back to the abstraction point, and a couple more highlights here, that uh, I think the aesthetic sense of both the operations and also the results uh, have a really nice thing that we like. We just like to see beautiful equations, you know, e to the i theta being Euler's identity. Beautiful means a whole lot and is used everywhere. And so... He gives an example, Wigner gives an example of complex numbers as one of these such things where we have, um, you know, certainly not in, our exper in the experience that we have on the introductory level do we expect to see complex numbers, but yet they lead to beautiful theorems. Complex analysis was made for this. We use it all the time in quantum mechanics and so on and so forth. But again, at first approach, he'd never think that complex numbers would lead to these things, but they do. And it's so, with the final remarks of this uh, passage, we have, Mathematician is not willing to give up his interest in these most beautiful accomplishments of his genius. That was pretty clever. I kind of like where, where the way and how he quotes these things like this. You can definitely tell that the writing styles in 1960 are a lot different from what they are today. So now, back to what is physics. And um, admittedly, I didn't think this would need to be in here in the first opening uh, statement, but I'm glad it is. Physics is interested in discovering the laws of inanimate nature. But what are laws of nature? And we need to analyze this concept. Again, I didn't want to, I didn't think it was needed, but it actually is a very good thing that it was put in here. And I like the reasoning he walks us through. Um, because we do have a baffling complexity and cannot predict the future based on the exact present, you know, things of that nature. It's hard to imagine that we can get any laws, period. But there are a couple miracles here that in spite of the baffling complexity of the world, certain regularities in the events could be discovered. And these regularities are, are what lead to the patterns that we can then make the law off of. And such, we see that Galileo you know, dropped two things from the same height and they reached the ground at the same time. This was then made into a law of nature concerned with the regularities that Galileo saw. And then in the next paragraph, he dives into even more of this, where he shows that, you know, as much as there was going around the dropping of two objects, the results stayed the same regardless of where they were, what they were, who dropped them, you know, was it whether it was the Leaning Tower of Pisa, a classroom, a laboratory, doesn't matter. The results stayed the same. And thus, we had a sense of invariance. And because we get to ignore so many characteristics of the environment itself, we have a different type of invariance, too, or irrelevancy, 
that's a different character as highlight it later um, because you know you're not going to have the same matching conditions in every single scenario it's almost impossible um, and so although the scope is low as many external uh, entities are irrelevant we get an impact that is very highly thought after and you and reasoned and allows for a lot of innovation later so a couple good takeaways from this was it is a skill and ingenuity of the experimenter which show his show him phenomena which depend on a relatively narrow set of relatively easily realizable and reproducible conditions i.e dropping from the same height and then again it is true that if there were no phenomena which are independent of all but a manageably small set of conditions, physics would be impossible. Imagine if we had to in, in, uh, imagine if we had to put together experiments that encompassed every single parameter known to man in order to replicate the result. It, it would the it, experiments would not work. It would not exist at all. And so, what this comes down to is a refinement of the law which states that the law of nature is contained in the statement that the length of time which it takes for a heavy object to fall for a given height is independent of the size, material, and the shape of the body which drops. So that is how we refine it into a law because that is the relatively narrow scope that we can work in. And then, you know, because of the narrow scope that we have, it becomes a weird thing to protest and see that not or not at all natural that laws of nature exist, much less that man are able to discover them. Very narrow. But because of the narrowing, we see that we end up adding layers of these narrow circumstances together, excuse me, into a more general and more encompassing law or set of laws that um, give us an understanding of a bigger picture. And we say that the small part of our knowledge of the inanimate world because we're ignoring so much else. So the layering idea is very important here because that is how we can generalize, which is a physical way of abstracting what we have. Moving on, in the next paragraph, we see that we have um, more to the narrow scope idea again. Laws of nature can be used to predict future events only under exceptional circumstances. So what we end up really doing is having a limiting criteria and that's very important for us in understanding when something can be applied and when something can't. And one good takeaway that I took from this was the construction of machines, the functions for which we can foresee, constitute the most spectacular accomplishment, accomplishment of physicists. Because we can know with a very high certainty what comes out of a machine given what we input into it. Whereas the rest of nature, probably not. That being said, what we have to do is be careful, of course, because with these limiting circumstances, we end up with having probabilistic statements, meaning that we not probabilistic, but conditional statements. If I propose these limited scope of options here, then I can have a replicatable result. That's a conditional statement. And so it takes into a, you know, uh, account for what kind of precision we can have for the conditionals. So as he says here, conditional statements cannot be entirely precise. And then he goes on to say that, you know, probabilistic nature will play no role in the rest of the discussion. It's not the same as saying like quantum mechanics, which is probabilistic in its uh, theory itself, but that we're assuming that for the sake of argument that all conditions that are needed are met for the sake of the discussion of the results. So now on to the next big part of the paper the role of mathematics in physical theories. Um, and this, I think, is where the paper starts to turn and we get a little more serious into the good stuff. Um, and math on the everyday level is, uh, you know, st just a computational tool. Think about counting the amount of books you have or understanding how uh, your finances, debits, credits, and all that. It's just a tool, but it doesn't have really any abstractional value unless you're trying to budget something like that. And so that's what he talks about in this uh, first two paragraphs uh, is that it's just a tool at the end of the day. That's, you know, on first sight, that's all math is to a lot of people. And what math is to the common uh, scientist is just a tool. However, it does have a big part in the theory of 
science and and uh, physics specifically, specifically, not opposite of Atlantic. Um, but uh, so what we take away from this next paragraph is that math is the language of physics, and the statement being. The statement that the laws of nature are written in the language of mathematics was properly made 300 years ago. I think all of us now can understand that and have a good perspective and insight on it, but making it 300 years ago, probably not the most well received. Um, and so we go into an example of how and why, and I think this is really fun. The fraction of all mathematical concepts is used uh, only a fraction of all mathematical concepts is used in physics. True. Just because it exists in math doesn't mean it's needed in physics, or that it's verifiable in physical theory. It is also that the concepts which, we, uh, which were chosen were not selected arbitrarily from a listing of mathematical terms, but were developed in many, in many if not most cases, independently by the physicist and recognized then as having been conceived before by mathematicians. And one of the big uh, thoughts that I had reading that particular segment was the Riemannian um, uh, work in geometry for the field equations for Einstein, or matrix mechanics for uh, quantum mechanics later. Then, of course, you know, we give up the fact that mathematicians made this, but now we have something that could use the tools given. Just because I have a toolbox full of every tool imaginable doesn't mean I need to have it for every single physical observation I make. Okay, so concepts of mathematics are not chosen from their concept concept uh, conceptual simplicity, but their clever manipulations, striking, and brilliant arguments. Complex numbers, once again, was thought of as a calculation trick for some of the equations, but then we see that it's close to being a necessity for the formulation of the laws of quantum mechanics. Which, speaking of, I just did an article review about the necessity for I in quantum mechanics. So if you want to see that video, please do. It's another fun one and showcases that math is not only just a con you know abstract conception of numbers, but that we have a really remarkable need for them in physics and quantum mechanics specifically. Okay, so here in the final uh, paragraph of this section, he gives us a nice, uh, well, what I found to be a nice couple of quotes. Two miracles of existence of laws of nature and of the human's mind, the human mind's capacity to divine them. Wow, not expecting that. And then further, that Einstein's statement that the only physical theories which we are willing to accept are the beautiful ones. And let's remember that beautiful simplicity and all that other stuff is nice, but it does not mean easy. F equals MA is a vector equation, and we know that some of forces, we have to break them down in vector components or Maxwell's equations with the gradients and novel squares or the Schrodinger equation, you know, all these nice equations or the field equations with tensors, right? It looks so elegant, but it is a lot of hidden in that equation. Um... So then the question leads us to, is the success of physical theories truly surprising? So let's scroll up and see what he has to say. Um, and to which he states that the possible explanation of physics, the physicist used in mathematics to formulate his laws of nature is that he is somewhat an irresponsible person. Now this may tie in tangentially, of course, to uh, Eric Weinstein's comments on uh, quackery and the most recent short I had. Um, but, I, you know, it's easy to allow math to guide you, but then the physics of the real world might not actually supply you. Uh, meaning that although there's a connection between two quantities which resemble a connection well known in mathematics, you know, we can't just jump to the conclusion that it's there because math says so. Right? So, I think we need to... Uh, be careful with that. And I wrote here in my notes, though it exists in math, we must not fool ourselves to believe it exists in nature. So again, we need empirical evidence in the case of science, and we just need it to be conceptually right in mathematics with all the rigors that they need for the theorems and proofs. But what we can do is use this idea of con the concept that we can have 
groups of solutions that look similar and put them in the same category. And one such example of this was uh, given here with the, you know, the planetary motion based on Newton's laws, things like that, which when we poke out a couple sentences here, uh, we have a parabola for the thrown rock's path on Earth and the circle of the moon's path in the sky. But these are all particular cases of the same mathematical object of an ellipse. And postulated the universal law of gravitation. That's what Newton did based on a single and very approximate numerical coincidence. And of course, this is uh, at the time that Newton proposed this, it was repugnant, right? So this goes back to the Eric's quackery comments again. And I think we need to press the boundary a little bit in order to make that progress. So I agree with everyone there. What I found uh, remarkable too is that uh, as far as accuracy is, con accuracy is concerned, all Newton had was a 4% accuracy in his archaic model or uh, data that he had then. But now with new technologies, we have an accurate to less than 10,000th of a percent. That is wild. So I agree it is a monumental example of a law. So the last thing to take away from this big paragraph here is that first, the law, pr particularly since the second derivative appears in it, is simple only to the mathematician, not to common sense or a non-mathematically minded freshman. Second, it is a conditional law of very limited scope. So being very consistent with that scope issue. Another example of this goes back to how, um, you know, we, we saw in the early realms of quantum mechanics, a lot of math being done, wave mechanics, matrix mechanics, what is right, what is wrong, when can something be used, when can't it be used. When can't it be used? Things of that nature. And so in this example, he talks about how the hydrogen and helium proved the matrix mechanics correct, although the old rules of computation didn't foresee these results happening. So insofar as math is concerned, it led to a result that is considered a miracle because the planned nature of the physics uh, experiment did not have that in it. And so it is an amazing property here that matrix mechanics uh, gave through to the uh, calculation or gave through to a um, result that's a miracle when uh, Heisenberg's calculating rules were meaningless. And in a sense, what they say is that um, they got something out of got something out of an equation that did not put in or something out of nothing in, in that kind of weird quasi sense. And to a remarkable accuracy of one part in 10 million. Um, I don't know about you, but if that was my accuracy, I'd be very happy. So, and you know, again, whether we look for it or not, it's worth taking note of that. So further, after this, par in the next paragraph, he just has more um, supporting evidence for what he saw above with the hydrogen and helium, which is again, a constant reassurance of miracles and there's only so many miracles you can have, right, before you build skepticism. But this keeps producing. It is wild. Um, and then finally, he gives one last example relating to quantum electrodynamics, which was a purely mathematical theory. And I think this is a very, very big pivot here, what we've seen here. Because QED was guided by math and then tested accurate. And then we also had originally that we collected data and then built a model off of the data. So one predicted the data, one is built off of the data. That is a switching point and why theoretical physics is having such a wonderful time in the math world because it's becoming harder and harder and more expensive to gather appropriate data for set theories. And so he summarizes this all in his last paragraph here. And don't worry, if you want this, I'll definitely post this to the Patreon so you can download the PDF because I think it's worthwhile. And then finally, we'll get to his second point. And we have uh, about five minutes left, so we'll run through it. The uniqueness of the theories of physics. And it's we're going to have to be a little careful here because it's going to take a lot of mental positioning for us to undo what we think we know or that we do know and reposition ourselves to a new perspective. And to which we say, it is absurd to believe that the existence of mathematically simple expressions for the second derivative of position is self-evident. 
when no such expressions for the position itself or for the velocity exist. Why is it that we see a second derivative for acceleration when we didn't see any when we didn't see that at all beforehand? That is a level of abstraction that we need to have a kind of self query about in so far as what is self evident. So from there, where we dive into is another one of his hidden quotes that I liked. Um, and this one rings to me personally because I like trying to piece together all the parts of theories and how do they fit together. And I think a lot of other scientists do too. And in this quote, he says, we may lose interest in the ultimate truth. That is in a picture, which is consistent fusion into a singular unit of little pictures formed with the various aspects of nature's. And what he does here is go through uh, two of the biggest theories now that are mutually exclusive groups of phenomena, one with quantum mechanics and one with relativity, which relativity we know deals with the, macrosco the macroscopic and quantum mechanics deals with the microscopic. Both theories are right in their own realms, their own capacities, but one deals with the four dimensional Riemannian space, the other with infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So their narrow alleys are those. And this example is, illustrates that the two possibilities of the union of conflict mentioned before, both of which are conceivable. Again, what we're struggling with here is that these two theories are very well accurate within their own narrow scopes. How is it that with them being polar opposites, quote unquote, or mutually exclusive, that they fit together in an ultimate truth? Either the ultimate truth would have to break down or these theories are compatible. And so, you know, most people tend to lean towards the ultimate truth, but we need to consider the other side of it is that what happens if they don't. And so to continue with this uh, topic or this concept, this next paragraph, he wants to you to reposition your perspective for what will come after. And so now, uh, scroll up a little bit. So now he's like, consider from the viewpoint the fact that these theories, which we know to be false, give such amazingly accurate results in the adverse factor. Had we somewhat less knowledge, the group of phenomena which are false theories explain what appear to us to be large enough to prove these theories. Theories considered to be false by us just for the reason that they are, an ultimate analysis incompatible with the more encompassing picture. Sufficiently many such false theories are discovered, they are bound to prove us also in conflict with one another. Again, we tend to critique ourselves based on a theory um, because we have these principles that we think are quote right or correct here that may not actually be um, you know, we tend to guide ourselves to those paths, neglecting all the other ones. But what happens if the body of evidence for the other ones is bigger than the ones that we deem as right? Do we then flip the perspective? Do we flip the screen, so to speak? Very uh, good thought train to have. However, as he states here, it is a nightmare of the theorist. And I could very much see why. And then he dives into an example with the free electron model. Um, by Bohr and you know how we could conceivably replace it because within the measurements of that narrow alley it was right however then we had to reformulate reformulate the model itself and so you know uh, right after that he says the free uh, electron theory raises doubts as to how much we should trust numerical agreement between theory and experiment as evidence for the correctness of a theory and I think that is very wise. And of course, the next one, he has more uh, supporting evidence. But then ultimately, he leaves us with this final quote. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift, which we neither uh, understand nor deserve. And with that, I wish you a good day. And until next time, stay curious and happy learning.